I realize this is my second video on the cooling system, but half the stuff in the first video I've already changed, and the other half didn't actually have anything to do with cooling, so we're going to call this part one. We didn't get very far last time because I kept getting distracted by things not cooling related, but in this video I will only get distracted a little bit, once or twice. But I promise by the end of this we will have a functional cooling system. In my previous video I talked about doing one coolant loop through all the systems, well I decided to split it up into two separate loops. I did this for two reasons. One is that I had a few smart people tell me it would be a good idea. I hate it when people comment, you're wrong, but I love it when people comment, you're wrong, and here's some data that demonstrates your wrongness. Those are good comments. Essentially, the electronics in the outhouse need to be pretty cool. Even if I was sticking with a single loop, I'd need to swap the flow so that the outhouse would be the first thing after the radiator, but the battery also probably won't love being fed hot fluid from the drive unit, and it has its own cooling needs. With two loops, I can run them both through the radiator, but then I can split them off into two, each having its own pump. Then I can alter the speed of the pumps independently for each system. This complicates things slightly, but not too much. The second reason I decided to do two loops is because this is basically how it's done in the Tesla, and at some point I might want to ditch my simple cooling system and swap in this awesome thermal management cube. Tesla upgraded this cube for the Model Ys and the newer Model 3s. These cars no longer have a condenser for the air conditioning. The AC compressor sends its heat to the coolant, which just goes through the radiator. This system is pretty amazing. There are always hot parts of a car and cold parts of a car and parts that need to be hotter or colder. This neat little box just takes the hot and cold from where it doesn't need to be and moves it to where it needs to be. This makes the whole car much more efficient. This is a complex system, but it's the best kind of complex system. It's the best kind because I don't have to know what's going on. I just install it and it figures everything out. But I'm not installing this today. Today, we're gonna stick with passive radiator cooling. Last time I installed the radiator, meaning I just sort of set it down on the frame where it goes, but this time we're actually going to install it. But first, I need to make a smaller outlet. This outlet will tee off into two electric pumps, each of which has a three-quarter inch inlet. It's actually a little less than three-quarter, maybe 21 30 seconds, or 41 60 fourths, or maybe even 471 730 fourths. This means that for the same flow area of these two, I will need an outlet of about one inch diameter. Since I'm tight on space here with a steering rack, I'm just going to weld on an aluminum puck and an offset barbed fitting. Except that, again, my electrical outlets are on the wrong side of the garage, and my welder won't really reach my work table, so I need to move the jag to the other side and swap everything over, completely swapping the entire garage. No, we're not going to do that this time. We're not going to get distracted. We're working on the cooling system, not the garage. All right, f*** it. After that was welded up, I connected the radiator inlet to the outlet to do a pressure test to make sure my welds were as good as they looked. And they do look good. I mean, relative to all my other mediocre welds. After that, I set the radiator and its stand down where it's supposed to go, marked its location, and drilled holes to bolt it to the frame. I made a mount for the fan. I just kind of cut up some aluminum I had lying around to sort of squish the fan to the radiator. I kind of thought of this as a temporary solution, but we all know that temporary solutions are the most permanent solutions. So it looks pretty good. I think I'm going to leave it. To pump the coolant all around the car, I'm going to use these two 12 volt coolant pumps from a Tesla Model S. I mounted these two to the frame right behind the radiator outlet. They come with rubber isolating mounts to keep the noise and vibration down. The top pump goes to the outhouse and then to the motor, and the bottom pump goes to the battery. These pumps are nice. They move a lot of coolant and you can control them down to 15% of their maximum speed so you can limit their current draw when you don't need it at full flow. At full tilt, they pull 15 amps together, so they're not messing around. By the way, a lot of people have asked me where I get all the Tesla parts for this car. I did not buy a salvaged Tesla and strip it. I actually just bought the parts I needed. I got most of them from a place in Sacramento called Cali Motive. These guys are awesome. They helped me out with all the parts I needed, including all the pumps and valves for the cooling system. So if you're doing this sort of thing and you're looking for Tesla parts, check them out. I put their link in the video description. 
I connected the inlet of the two pumps with a Y fitting. I originally just had a flexible hose from the radiator to the Y, but it looked kind of sloppy. So I welded up two aluminum bends to make part of it rigid. It looks a lot better this way. Inside the battery, I have a hose running all the way to the back into a manifold that splits into four smaller hoses, one going to each of the four modules. This manifold isn't the best design since I'll get more flow out of this hose than I will out of this hose, but it's probably fine. At the other end of the battery, the four hoses come back together and back out the front. Then that connects with the coolant line coming from the back of the car with another Y fitting, and then it works its way to the radiator. To get the coolant around the car, I needed to make coolant lines. Tesla has these awesome plastic molded lines running around the car, but my setup is so different that I can't really use any of them. Actually, I could use one, the one that connects the inverter to the motor oil heat exchanger, but for all of the rest of them, I had to make my own hoses. I haven't yet found a place where I can send a CAD model and get a one-off CNC bent thin wall aluminum tube for any reasonable price. If you know of a place, let me know. But in the meantime, I get to play build a tube. You can buy bends and reducers and reducing bends, but it gets expensive when you're running lines all over a whole car. Here's what I did. I bought several hoses that were the right diameter that had multiple bends in them. These are made for other cars. I don't know which ones, I don't care. I just got these and I cut them up to get the bends I needed. Between the bends, I used either barbed unions for the parts that were close together or rigid aluminum tube for the longer sections. Here's what you do. Buy aluminum tube that has a wall thickness of 035 and then put a bead on the end. There are a couple of ways to put a bead on. One I showed last time with this tool. You rotate the smaller hex to push the ball bearings out and then rotate the whole thing to put a bead inside the tube. I like these, but they only work for one size tube and they're not super cheap. This is a better tool. It works with anything down to three quarters of an inch and aluminum wall thickness up to 065. It says it doesn't work on stainless, but I bet you could probably get it to work on thin wall stainless. But here's the thing I didn't realize about these beaded tubes. You need a really good clamp on them. These little pinchy things, they work great on the barbed fittings, but on the beaded tube, they sometimes won't get a good seal. I chased all around my cooling system looking for leaks before I either just replaced all of them with screw clamps or doubled them up. I fixed all of those and was still getting a leak in my pressure test, so I just filled the entire system with water and pressurized it to see where it was leaking out. But before I did this, I pressure checked the battery coolant loop and the outhouse coolant loops independently. I don't want to find the leak by dripping it onto high voltage. Those loops were good, so I filled it carefully with tap water, and I know some of you are freaking out about tap water, but it'll be fine for now. I have three local minimums in my coolant loop, so I can get basically all of it drained out and replaced with G48 when I'm done futzing with the system. Tesla uses G48, which is used by a bunch of the European manufacturers. I don't need maximum cooling or antifreeze, but I do need to use something that can lubricate the pump motors, seals, and prevent corrosion, and G48 does that well. I also mentioned in my last video that I probably don't need the swirl pot. Upon further consideration, I think it might be needed. There is a lot of opportunity for air to be trapped up in the outhouse since it's so high up. I thought about putting a bleed valve in there, but at that point I might as well just put in a whole swirl pot, considering that it is the highest point in the system. There are three local high points in my coolant loops. One is the swirl pot, it's the highest point, and the fill point. The other is the radiator. It has a cap, and I got one with a valve on it to bleed out the air without taking the cap off. The third local high point is at the top of the motor, just after the motor oil heat exchanger. From the oil cooler, the tube runs back to the radiator, but it first goes down to the bottom of the car. This outlet point is lower than the radiator inlet, so technically I could have just run a tube through the middle of the passenger compartment at a slight incline, but that would have been obtrusive. Since the tube goes back down, I'll need to have a way to get out any air that collects up there. One thing I could do is tee in with a small diameter tube and run it up to the swirl pot. That would just naturally bleed air up and out. A simpler solution is to just add a screw in bleeder valve. I'll just unscrew this to bleed out any air that collects up here. I'll do that a few times and then when I'm not getting any more air out, I'll just screw it down and put some safety wire on it. So to actually fill this thing with water, I will need to run the pumps so they can push the coolant through and get all the bubbles out. And to run the pumps, I need a pump controller. These pumps will alter their speed based on a PWM input. You give them 12 volts, and then on one of the wires, you just switch five volts on and off two times a second, two hertz. The amount of time it spends at five volts dictates how fast the pump spins. Five volts on for 400 milliseconds and then off for 100 milliseconds is an 80% duty cycle. That makes the pump run at full speed. 100 milliseconds on and 400 off is a 20% duty cycle, and that makes the pump run at its minimum speed. Adjust that duty cycle between 20% and 80%, and you adjust the pump's speed. This is pretty easily done with an Arduino. I wrote some code that reads a potentiometer and then spits out a PWM signal between 20 and 80, depending on how far you turn the potentiometer. In the future, I will probably plug in a coolant temperature sensor that will automatically speed up the pump as the coolant gets hot, but for now, I'm just going to set it at 50%. 
You can just plug 12 volts into these things and they will run at full speed. They look for a PWM signal for about five seconds and when they don't see one, they go into a fail safe mode and just run it 100%. So if you're looking for the lazy way, there you go. I will also throw a link to the Android code in the video description. So fill it with water, run the pumps. I can test my controller on the pumps to make sure it speeds up and slows down with the potentiometer. Ooh, very nice. Once the system is all filled, which we can check with my handy level tube on the swirl pot, we can pressurize the system to see where it's leaking. Oh, right there. I forgot to change out these two pinch clamps on this beaded tube. So swap that out, pressure test again, and we're good. I came back a couple of hours later and we were still at the same pressure. There are a few small things I still need to do. I need some sort of fan control, probably with a temperature sensor. You can get a dummy sensor that will turn on a fan relay at a predetermined temperature, but those sensors are all way too hot for the electric powertrain. So I'll need to put some more code into the coolant pump Arduino. But like I said, I'll need to have a couple of temperature sensor inputs anyway to control the pump speeds. I believe that Tesla starts their active cooling with the air conditioning compressor at around 113 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll probably have the pumps and fans at full tilt a bit before that. I'll update the code in the description when I get around to adding that. I also, of course, need to drain out all the tap water and fill this with G48. This isn't technically cooling system related, but I am going to add braces between these grill supports and the radiator. That will give the radiator a lot more support longitudinally, and it will also help to brace the grill side to side so it won't be all wobbledy wobbledy while I'm driving down the road. All of that stuff will be done soon, but as of right now, I have a functional cooling system on the Jag. I also finished my brakes pretty recently, so we might be driving this thing pretty soon. Stay tuned. It used to be that you had to impress people to get people to watch your show. Now you just have to impress the algorithm. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. All hail the algorithm.